Mark once again in the 11th chapter. Mark chapter 11. Well, the long journey from Hermon is now ending. Jesus Christ is entering into Jerusalem. It's time for the Passover. And he himself is going to be the Passover lamb, unknown to anyone but God the Father. The Passover lamb was given a week to inspect before it was sacrificed. It would make its entrance into Jerusalem and then uh, they would inspect it for the week, keep an eye on it, make sure it's without spot and without blemish and perfect in every way. And Jesus Christ is now spending his final week before the crowd there in Jerusalem as God's Passover lamb. And they're going to find within him no fault whatsoever as he lives out his last few days now beneath the shadow of the cross before he goes to Calvary. It all begins here in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him with hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The message today is entitled, The King is Coming. The King is Coming. Let's pray before we begin. Now, Father, we come before thee at this time. We thank you for this uh, epic moment. We thank you now for the uh, chance to study this book and, and now coming to this chapter and the walk to Calvary for our Savior. Help us now to take it all in. Help us to appreciate what he did for us and to rejoice in the salvation that was purchased through it. And we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the year was 30 A.D., best we can figure, and the month was, I guess, our April. It would be the first Jewish month, though, the month Nisan for them. And Jesus Christ here has covered a distance of about 18 miles through the hilly terrain between Jericho and Jerusalem. Jericho is in a valley and, and Jerusalem's on a mountain. And so he has risen about 3,500 feet to get to the level of Jerusalem at this time. And he's about to make his grand entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, it's going to be a, a big fanfare and a grand entrance, as I said, but it's kind of odd that it would be that because up to this point, we found that the Lord has been shunning publicity. He's been healing people and saying, now, keep this under your hat. He's been opening blind eyes and saying, don't tell them who did it. Don't tell anyone about this. So why all of a sudden now is he making this grand entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey? Well, prophecy had to be fulfilled, first of all. You see, several hundred years earlier in Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says, Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a colt. This was all prophesied to happen hundreds of years earlier. And if you follow the ministry of Christ as we've studied this book, you find that he is continually fulfilling prophecy. That's so important. He had told John the Baptist years earlier in Matthew 3.15, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ fulfilled hundreds of prophecies when he walked this earth. Well, enthusiasm is now to fever pitch in, in Jerusalem, and they're eager for the long-awaited Messiah to finally come to town and to deliver them. To deliver them from who or what is the question. Well, the Jews at this time were under Roman oppression, and, and the Romans under the Neros and the Caesars were pretty hard on the Jewish people. They hated them. And so they taxed them hard, and they were, they were roughing them up. And, and the Jews wanted to overthrow this Roman tyranny here and restore a theocracy to Israel there. It's coronation time, at least in their minds, but this coronation is unlike any other. 
In fact, at most coronations, and I've never witnessed the coronation of a king or a queen in England, but it's a big, big deal. And it's all well planned, but, but this one is spontaneous. It just kind of happens out of the blue here. Normally there's this uh, ceremony and it's just full of pomp and circumstance, but here's the humble Jesus Christ riding into town on a donkey. How different. Normally it's a, a very official event, a coronation. This one's real unofficial. Normally it's full of VIPs and dignitaries, but this one was shunned by the very dignitaries and the VIPs. Yet as the king is coming here, we find some very interesting things. Let's look at them. First of all, we find what I call the chosen arrangement, a, a chosen scheme or a plan, all pre-planned in the mind of Christ. Notice in verse number 1, it says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. Now, if you look behind me, you find a map, and it's kind of a lousy one here, but you find here um, kind of the, the uh, city of Jerusalem, and uh, you find here that the Mount of Olives, and I'm not finding my pointer here, sorry about that, but we find that the Mount of Olives is over to the right, and again, it's a little bit fu uh, fuzzy, and as you follow that red line, you go through what is the Kidron Valley, and down near the base, and it drops about 700 feet from the Mount of Olives, you find the Garden of Gethsemane, and kind of in the middle there, you find the temple. Well, Christ came into Jerusalem just on the north side of the temple. He's going to go in and look the temple over. We won't get to that today. But then he was going to go back to, uh, to the house of, of probably Mary and Martha and Lazarus over in Bethany. Now, you find the names Bethage and Bethany in nearby towns or suburbs, if you will, of Jerusalem. The word Beth means house of, like Bethlehem. And, and, and Bethphage means the house of figs. And Bethany means the house of dates. Now, they're both near the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is very, very famous. It's, it's the mount where the olives grow, named after them. But it uh, goes way back to Old Testament times and, and very historic. In fact, when Absalom chased his, his father David out of town, King David, in his treason, we find out that David leaves from the east of Jerusalem and he heads out into the wilderness, but he passes over the Mount of Olives in the process. And in 2 Samuel 15, 30, David went up by the Mount of Olives and he wept as he went and had his head covered and he went barefoot. Now this was about a thousand years earlier, about a thousand BC or so, but it's a very historic place found in the Old Testament, but it's very significant to future events as well. You know the Bible speaks of the Mount of Olives having quite a, a place in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Zechariah wrote about it in chapter 14 verse 4. It says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a, a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. It's talking about when Christ comes back again. And by the way, he ascended the first time from the Mount of Olives. He's coming back again in such manner as they saw him go, landing upon the Mount of Olives once again, walking down the 700-foot plateau there, down to the eastern gate of, of the temple, which is going to open of its own accord, and he's going to come in as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But notice it mentions here when he comes down the mountain, it's going to cleave in half and kind of break toward the different directions there. You know, there was a, um, uh, it was a chain years ago that was going to build a building in the vicinity of the Mount of Olives. And they did some seismographing ahead of time to find out if it was safe to build there. And guess what they found? They found a fault line buried beneath the Mount of Olives, just like described here in the book of Zechariah. Our Bible is true. That fault line is there. Now, on the east side of Jerusalem, you've got the the Kidron Brook, which is normally dried up at different times of the year. And, and you find that this Mount of Olives is about a third mile away from Jerusalem called a Sabbath day's journey in the book of Acts. That was about a third of a mile. And the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ would pray beneath the olive trees, uh, is still there to this day. But you've got Bethage, you've got Bethany, the, the village of Lazarus there. And, and you find all the setting there for what we're looking at here. Now, in verse number one, it mentions that uh, Jesus sendeth forth two of his disciples at the end of the verse. It doesn't tell us who they are anywhere. But I think maybe they were James and John. 
I mean, if you had two guys jockeying for position to sit on the right hand of Christ and the left hand of Christ, and you needed somebody to go get a donkey, wouldn't this be a good thing to do? Kind of humble them and say, oh, you want to be big shots. Okay, well, let's uh, have you go get the donkey then and teach you what it's all about as far as serving goes. And it would serve him right if he did. Because uh, if, if you want to lead, lead a donkey, okay? <laughs> let's start there with the donkey. And, and, you know, Christ had earlier taught him a principle they'd missed. But in Luke 22, 26, he had said, But he that is greatest among you, let him be as he that doth serve. So maybe it was James and John, or maybe one of them was Peter. Peter was also arguing uh, who would be the greatest and, and eventually would be a leader there in the church. And, and may, maybe Christ is trying to, trying to keep him humble by sending him after that donkey. And whoever it was, they knew the details of this guy asking him, what are you doing there and all that. And Mark got his account from Peter. Remember that? So maybe very well one of them was Peter. Now, in verse 2... Christ is still talking or about to talk and he saith unto them go your way into the village over against you and as soon as ye be entered into it you shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat loose him and bring him now I don't know if you caught it there but this is a donkey that had never been ridden now if you've ridden a horse uh, it's fine if you if you ride it after somebody has broken the horse. Anyone here ever broken a horse? You know what I mean by that? It, it's a wild horse and you're the one who has to tame it so you can put a saddle on and all that thing. Well, here we find uh, this wild donkey and nobody has ever sat on this donkey here. How'd you like to untie this donkey? It's sitting there braying and kicking and, and making noise and all that. And it, it wouldn't be on my bucket list to ride this wild donkey, I'll tell you that here. But Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen here. You're going to go into town, this place where two streets meet. You're going to see this donkey sitting there. If somebody asks you, what are you doing messing with my donkey? Here's what you say. How did Christ know all that? Well, we've talked about this already. Jesus is an omniscient uh, God and, and uh, he knew everything. In fact, he, he saw Nathan or Nathaniel under that fig tree praying he saw that fish with the golden coin in his mouth and told Peter just put the hook out there and he'll get on your hook and the point is Christ had a heavenly view of everything all the time there's a there's a little verse found over in John 3 that shows us just a glimpse of the the omniscience or the omnipresence of Jesus Christ and it's when Christ was talking to Nicodemus that night and in verse 13 he said no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Wait a minute. He's talking to Nicodemus on the earth and referring to himself as being in heaven at the time. Connect the dots there and you realize Christ had this heavenly view of the earth. And so he could see this donkey sitting over there. He could see this guy next to him who's going to ask what he's doing with my donkey. He could see that fish with the golden coin. He could see all that going on. Now, in verse 3, Christ tells these two men, He said, If any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him away. The Lord. The Lord? If he's the Lord, why does he have to borrow a donkey? <laughs> you thought about that? I mean, if he's the Lord, he, he should be some kind of a king. What's he doing borrowing a donkey? Well, the answer to that is First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians 8 and verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Christ owned the, the robe on his back, basically. That's it. And though he had all the riches of glory as he sat on the right hand of the throne of God, he laid all that aside, emptied himself of that, and came down here and was made poor for our sake, that through his poverty we might be made rich, a child of God, have a mansion in heaven, have a salvation uh, as a result of that. Here he is, the pauper king. And though he made everything and though he owned everything, we find he's poor. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So here's the Son of God who owned everything, having to borrow a donkey. And these two men are right. The Lord hath need of him. The Lord had a lot of needs as he walked this earth. He was fed by others. Uh, he was housed by others. He borrowed fish and loaves from a little boy to feed a crowd. He didn't have anything. He, he borrowed a boat to preach a sermon from. He didn't own it. 
He borrowed grave clothes to be buried in. He was poor. You know, for our sake he became poor that we might be made rich. But it's a, it's a strange kind of a monarch here as we see this scenario here. Now he's borrowing a donkey, which brings me to my second thought here. We see the chosen arrangement. Secondly, we see the common animal, this humble, simple animal, a donkey. In verse number 4, And they went their way and found the colt, tied by the door without in a place where two ways meet, and they loose him. Now, Matthew gives us a little more insight in his account of this scenario. In Matthew 21, 4 and verse 5, or, uh, yeah, 4 and 5 says, All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a colt. Jesus Christ is going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And never has a beast of burden been more honored, ever, than to have God on his back. Can you imagine? The Son of God riding you into town. In verse 5, Sure enough, and certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. Now, I don't know for sure, but most likely this was a disciple. As soon as they said, The Lord hath need of him, oh, okay, uh, the Lord needs him. He's unnamed. We don't know who he is. Kind of makes this little a cameo appearance here in the Bible. There are a lot of people like that in the Bible, by the way. Unnamed, unmentioned, just, just kind of pass through the Scriptures of Holy Writ, and one day we'll, we'll meet him in heaven. I was thinking this last week of some of these funerals I've done and, and some of the, the folks who are now in heaven. I was thinking of Max and, and how there's, there's so many people in heaven that he is meeting. The little lad who borrowed the loaves and fishes or, or maybe the, the soldier who when uh, the, 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 the earthquake at the death of Christ said, certainly this man was the Son of God and became a believer and we're going to meet him one day. I think of all the people that that we're going to get acquainted with. And, and you're, going to, you're going to go up to him and you're going to say, who are you? And, uh, and then he's going to say, well, you know that guy that borrowed Jesus the donkey there in his triumphant entry? That's me. You're going to, get out of here, really? And you're going to hug and have this, you know, there's all kinds of people like that in heaven. And here's one that cheerfully gave what he had, a donkey. And Christ required this donkey. And you go, well, well where does Jesus get off, you know, asking for that donkey? Remember, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, and by him all things consist. He owns it all. What right does Jesus have to you or your life or your things? Everything. Let's never forget that. He owns it all. We are but stewards of it, taking care of it while we pass through this earth here. We see the chosen arrangement. We see the common animal. And then thirdly, we see the celebrated arrival. The celebrated arrival. Now, in verse number 7, it says, And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. Christ sits on the donkey. And before you think a donkey is, is like, really? You know, who'd ride a donkey? There's a lot of people in the Bible actually who rode donkeys. When Caleb's daughter rode up to him and, and had a favor to ask, she was on a donkey. When Abigail, remember her? David was about to, to wipe out the household of Nabal and, and Abigail, his wife, came down the hill on a donkey to intercede. There was Abraham, when he was told to go sacrifice his son Isaac, he saddled this donkey and he went to that spot. There was, of course, Balaam's donkey and that's probably the one most of us think about. Uh, Balaam rode a donkey. There's a lot of judges and their sons mentioned in the Old Testament. They rode on donkeys. Uh, David rode on a donkey. Ahithophel, his friend, rode on a donkey. Uh, remember that uh, prophet that was slain by that lion for not following orders? Uh, he was riding a donkey. There are a lot of donkey riding going on in the Bible. It was, it was common. But here's Christ now riding a donkey. It's time for this, this big processional. And in verse 8, it says, And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. Now keep in mind, it's loud, it's busy. This is a, a donkey that had never been ridden before. And all these palms are being thrown at his feet here in garments. And he would have normally freaked out. I mean, all this, this uh, activity there and excitement. But he stays calm. And, and he's just got God on his back and he's heading toward the city wall there. It's uh, probably the 10th of, of Nisan or the 1st of April. And it, it, would, it would have been the day 
that they brought the Passover lamb into town to start inspecting it. You see a lot of parallels here? Here's Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, uh, coming for his final week, being set apart, getting ready to be sacrificed. Notice in verse number 9, And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. What does that mean? I mean, we use that word. It's a universal word, really, in almost every language. But what did it mean to the Jewish people who were saying it? The word Hosanna here means, Oh, save us now. Oh, save us now. And what they were referring to here is, You're the Messiah. We hate the Romans. We want to throw this yoke off of us of the Romans. Oh, save us now. And they were quoting something way back from Psalm 118, 25. Save now, I beseech or beg thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Save us now. You ever felt like that, by the way? Had your back to the wall and say, Lord, <laughs> get me out of this. They're saying in verse number 9, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of of the Lord. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, months earlier, Christ had foretold that they would say this. He was being harassed by the Pharisees and he left the area. He said this before he left in Luke 13, 35. He said, Ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He foretold it, predicted it. Now, here's this crowd and they're actually quoting the Old Testament, uh, a messianic psalm, Psalm 118, and they knew it. And in Psalm 118, verse 25 says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord. I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Oh, now we're really getting to what they wanted. Uh, they didn't just want the Romans off their back. They wanted all this prosperity they remember back in the days of David and Solomon. And so here's this messianic psalm. And, and the only Messiah that they could fathom was this leader of prosperity. Oh, save us now. Send now prosperity. That's what they were thinking in their minds at the time. Now, we find out here that this uh, same crowd is going to turn on Christ later on. But in verse 10, they're saying, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's hard to believe that within days, in, it, within days the tide would turn and, and these fickle Jews here would be demanding the death of Jesus Christ. At the trial of Christ, days later in Mark 15, 12, Pilate would answer and say unto them, What will ye that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. From Hosanna, save now, to crucify him you know that's pitiful isn't it it's sad and yet I like the fact there's still hope because if you follow the storyline on for even a few weeks after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and after Calvary up into Pentecost you find that same crowd getting preached the gospel by Peter in verse 36 saying therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what should we do they realized they had blown it what can we do now to fix it and 3,000 people get saved that day what a glorious time it was there were still some holdouts some holdouts even from Pentecost and, and you find in the next chapter a miracle happens the gospel is preached again in Acts 3.14. Peter says, This time you killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, where we are witnesses. And now, brethren, I wot or know that through ignorance you did it, as did your rulers. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. They had messed up, but there was still hope. They could still repent. By the way, maybe you've messed up, but there's this hope of repentance that God graciously extends mercy at such times. And God would even to this crowd here who had said, Hosanna one day, crucify him the next, and what are we going to do now the next day here? Now, there's a couple incredible things in this whole scenario here that we do not find on the surface. But it's so important that we look at them here. Um, I'm going to tell you something that you can Google and you can find this out to be through online here. 
But it's something you've got to know because it's pretty amazing. We're teaching the book of Daniel this week in, in the Bible College. It's a course I taught for many years before I handed it over to someone. But within the book of Daniel, there is some pretty incredible proof that only Jesus Christ could have been the Messiah. You see, the Jews today are still waiting for the Messiah to come. Are still waiting to crown him king. And they'll believe in the Antichrist one day when he comes along until he turns on them. But there's a lot of men over the years who have claimed to be the Messiah. But only Jesus Christ could have been. I want to show you that. And it is vital to your faith when you see this here. In the book of Daniel, you find a period of time mentioned referred to as 70 weeks. How many have heard of the 70 weeks as mentioned in the book of Daniel? Those weeks are not literal weeks. Actually, the Hebrew word there means a unit of seven. It doesn't say what it is. It's not necessarily days. It's just a unit, uh, seven units of something. And I don't have time to show you why this is true, but a careful study of it shows you that it's seven years. Each week represents a time period of seven years. Now put your thinking caps on. If there's 70 weeks times seven years, how many years does that equal total? 490, right? So you got this time period of 490 years made up of these 70 weeks, each representing seven years. Now, if you, if you know the book of Daniel, it covers 69 out of 70. They're just, you know, it's, it's Daniel basically saying, here's what's going to happen between now and the arrival of Christ. And I'm telling you, with pinpoint accuracy, he describes Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, the splitting of the Grecian Empire four ways, and, and Rome coming on the scene. Even Cleopatra and folks like that are referred to. All that history, in fact, with so much detail it's given that they thought, oh, he, he wrote it after the fact. No, Daniel was written before the fact. And so you find Daniel burning up 69 of the 70 weeks, leaving just one week left, which is future. That's what the book of the Revelation is all about. It covers the final week, that 70th week there. It's going to be the tribulation period there. Now, back to the 69 weeks. If you've got 69 um, units of seven years, 69 times 7 years gives you 483 years. It's real simple. You just take 7 years off the 490. 490 minus 7 is 483. So you've got this 483 year time period between Daniel, right around 500 AD, up until the time of Jesus Christ. There's something in the book of Daniel that tells us about this very day when Christ would make his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and, and present himself, but be rejected. He's, he's coming in as the Prince of God, the Son of God. Here's the verse. Daniel 9.25 says, From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto or until... The Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, how many is threescore? That's 60, right? A score is 20. So three times 20, you've got 60 years. And then you've got seven on top of that and two more. And so you're talking 69 weeks. So what it's telling us here is there's going to be a time period of 483 years from the time that the commandment is given to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem up until Jesus Christ makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem as Messiah the Prince. Think about this. The question then becomes, when was the commandment given to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? That's our starting point, right? Once we know that, we can figure out, and they should have known, when the Messiah is actually going to make his entrance here. Well, when was the command to rebuild Jerusalem? Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in two, two, two times, really 606 B.C., but he really demolished it in, in 586 B.C. It lay there for 70 years for sure as the land enjoyed her Sabbaths. And finally, Cyrus says, you guys can go back. And there's this time period where the building project is on again and it's off again. The people, the enemies of God, Sanballat and Tobias and all those guys are interrupting the plan and so it's, it's laying on hold and on pause for a while and, and this, the letters are going back and forth to Babylon there and, and Persia and, and finally, finally they get this decree during the days of Nehemiah. And you remember the story, right? 
Artaxerxes Longimanus, who was the king at that time, gives Nehemiah permission to go back and build that city once and for all. Those of you who are in the Holy Land in, in about a week and a half from now, you're still going to see some of those stones on the southeast wall of Jerusalem dating back to the days of Nehemiah. They're still there when they rebuilt the place. Now, when did that decree go forward? You can look this up in the, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but on March 14th, 445 B.C., the decree was given to go. Mark that date. March 14th, 445 B.C. Now the 483-year period, the countdown begins. If you go from 445, even roughly B.C., uh, up, up uh, 483 years, you shoot past it by 38 years. And you go, wait a minute, that brings us to 38 A.D., uh, that can't figure. Well, you have to transpose the Jewish calendar, which was 360 days, into the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar, which was 365 days as we know it today. Really throw the calendars out and use days. And if, if you take uh, 483 years, you've got 173,880 days. I stayed up all night counting. 173,880 days. If you do that from the time the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem, March 14, 445 B.C., and you go that distance of 173,880 days, it brings you right up to the Passover of 30 A.D. And now, here's the significance, and, and, and Luke gives us some insight to it. When Christ made his entrance into Jerusalem in Luke 19, 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, uh, he says, but now they're hid from thine eyes. You just don't get it. He wrote in on the very day that Daniel prophesied he would. He wept because he didn't get it. He said, oh, if you'd have only known this is your day. But they didn't. And then he went on and he said, Within a few years, they're going to come in and level this place. Not one stone will be left upon another. And that took place in 70 A.D. when Titus, the Roman general, came to town and leveled Jerusalem. You know, our Bible is true, folks. And our Bible is credible. And, and God is real. And that's what I want you to see from this. This is a fabulous truth. Only Jesus Christ could have been the Messiah. So forget anyone else before or after who comes along saying, Oh, I'm him. Couldn't have been. The Antichrist could not be. It was Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. How sad, though, that most don't. How sad that the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish elders, had no use for this meek Messiah on a donkey. They wanted a, a militant Messiah. Well, it wasn't time yet. But there is coming a time when the Messiah will be militant. There is coming a time... It's called the rapture, when God's people are going to be lifted off this earth. It's the next event on God's prophetic calendar. The world is going to go through a bloodbath of chaos known as the tribulation period, followed by the battle of Armageddon and the return of Christ. And, and this same Jesus that left from the Mount of Olives is going to come back to the Mount of Olives. And one day he's going to make his entrance back, not on a donkey, by the way, this time. We read in Revelation 19.11, John says, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and on his head were many crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And those of you who are students of the Bible, you know what this is talking about. Jesus Christ will not come back on the donkey. It will be on a white stallion. And he will supernaturally slay the wicked enemies of God with the same power of his word that he spoke the universe into existence. It will be nothing to him. He'll put down all wars. He'll put down all rebellion. There'll be no terrorists, none of that stuff. He's going to set up an earthly kingdom for a thousand years. It's called the Millennial Kingdom. And it's described in that famous chapter, Isaiah 9, verse 6, where it says, The government shall be upon his shoulder and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. That's going to be the time of coronation. In fact, Jeremiah describes it in Jeremiah 33:15. It says, And at that time will I cause the capital B branch of righteousness 
to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. And so after the final judgment, as described in the Bible, eternity will begin. Eternity will begin. Now, may I say in closing, the real coronation, the real coronation of Jesus Christ is a personal one. In fact, the songwriter put it this way, King of my life, I crown thee now, right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever personally coronated the Son of God as the King of your life? I did. It was March 5th, 1981. You say, you know the date? Well, everybody doesn't always remember the date, but they sure remember the time, the event, where they were, how it happened. When they realized, I can't save myself by my good works. My baptism doesn't wash sin away. My, my taking communion and, and doing good deeds and all this stuff cannot merit me heaven because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But it's according to the grace of God, the mercy of God that He saves us. We need to just acknowledge how badly we need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Calvary's cross to, to atone for our sin. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness of sin. And finally, after years of trying to lift myself up by my bootstraps and work my way to heaven, I realized what a sinner I was and how, how, how far I fall short of the glory of God and why I needed a Savior. It's simply a matter of changing your mind about your sin. It's called repentance in the Bible and placing all your faith in what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross and crowning Him Lord of all. Have you done that? That is the real coronation time. I hope you've had such a time in your life because the King is coming. The King is coming back and I hope you'll be ready when He does come. Let's stand to our feet, please. I'd like to ask that our heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we give a word of invitation here this morning. How glorious is the Word of God and the truths contained within it and how glorious is the Son of God and I hope you love learning about Him. I hope uh, we, we magnified Him this morning. But maybe there are some here today and you don't really know Him as King of your life. You've never had that time when you bowed the knee in submission to Him and made Him your Lord and Savior. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? And what are you trusting in to take you? What do you base your salvation on? Is it the truth of God's Word that salvation is a free gift to be received through repentance and faith? Or is it some man-made religion which you've been taught in the past that's hard to shake? If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Because you can. These things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. Father, we come before Thee this morning. We thank You now for the story of Christ, our, our King. And Lord, we're so thankful for the testimonies of hundreds here who would say they have crowned him. But Lord, there are some in our midst, no doubt, who have not understood or maybe uh, hardened their hearts. Maybe there's something between them and, and thee that they don't want to change their mind about or repent of. And Father, I just pray now that you do a work of grace in their hearts and in their lives. And Father, I pray that they would bow that knee and surrender to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.